I find my inspiration mostly from the forests and their inhabitants. So mostly northern forests and all the animals that live in them, um, which is endless. So I figure I'll be working on that for a very long time. When I begin a drawing, I usually don't have a very concrete concept in mind. Um, so I like to sort of see where it goes. It usually goes somewhere that I don't expect it to. So. Typically my drawings are just things that I want to see. So they revolve around the forest and animals and all sorts of situations that I think should exist. My name is Jess Polanchek. I am an illustrator living in Fairfax, Vermont, and I draw woodland illustrations. Some people see my work as kind of dark and spooky. Um, others think it's like fun and light and playful. So like personally, I don't know if there's one emotion that I, I get from it, but definitely more on the fun side, I would think. My illustrations are a combination of realism and imagination. So, uh, like for example, I'll draw a fox but then add like, antlers just because I feel like it'd be fun to see. When I'm physically drawing, I feel super relaxed and, and honestly, I'm, I'm having a blast. So, um, even those tiny little dots after, you know, one after another, like for hours and hours, it just kind of flies by. My brother and I were raised by a single mom. Uh, we moved all throughout Vermont and Florida um, almost once a year for, for most of our childhood. We didn't really have a lot of money, so uh, we were you know, taught to work with what we have. Art is really easy to make with anything that you can find, uh, which is a really important learning aspect for me. To be perfectly honest, what I draw is what I want to see. Um, and it's just very convenient that other people like looking at it also. I grew up as a very independent kid, kind of doing my own thing most of the time, so it, it's a natural process for me. I like being in my studio with my dogs and um, my partner, and it's, it's, it's very easy. My business name is Palanchik of the Hills, which I started in 2013. I try to control everything and do it all in my studio as much as I can. And that's been a major, major learning process uh, from the marketing to the packaging to the production. I think what my generation is super good at is using all this new media to promote themselves and, and make a living. It's out there and it helps you connect with the entire world. So. Using it is, is fun, but it's also very, very important. I've always loved making art, but it was never an actual career path that I had in mind growing up. Um, I was really interested in mechanical engineering um, and then also the, the military, because um, most of my family is military, so it was a natural path um, I thought I would join the Navy and just go on my way and go to college and all that stuff, but it ended up changing drastically and it was, it was for the better. I took a trip through Europe and got to see all the crazy, amazing architecture over there, so that's definitely a huge part of what I have been doing recently anyway. In the past two years or so, I did a series called Home, and that incorporates wooden Russian churches and tops of temples and things like that. So I like taking pieces of things and merging them into what I usually do. I would say my real style began in 2012 when I started this drawing of a fox wearing a cloak made out of feathers. Uh, so each feather was tiny and drawn individually and it was just the most fun process. After that I started working in series and built off of that. One of my biggest inspirations is walking in the woods and just wandering around because it's so filled with, with details, like all the broken branches and the leaves and just everything on the forest floor. Like, it's an endless supply of inspiration. So. Making a life out of art, from the marketing to the packaging to the production, it's all fun. 
My goal for the future, I would say, is just to grow my business as much as I can. Um, I love, you know, getting new shops all over the world. It's it's really fun to spread my art as far as it can go. So I don't really have a concrete idea of where I want things to be, and I kind of like it that way um, because it allows me to try new things and kind of, you know, stray from the path every once in a while. About seven years ago, I uh, transferred up to the University of Vermont from Massachusetts. I took all the jewelry classes I could, and I really focused on metal and sculpture, kind of outside of those classes. And sculpture is definitely part of jewelry. I think that maybe one of the most interesting things about jewelry is how cross-disciplinary it can be. You know, jewelry just draws a lot of outside influences because it's something that people have worn since the dawn of time. People enjoy adornment, and the more interesting and unique you can make it, it's just, yeah, it just has a lot of color. I start all my work with sketches, and from those sketches, I usually transfer my sketches to graph paper. And from there, I cut that out, and then I transfer that to a piece of copper. And I cut that piece of copper out, and that copper piece becomes my template. So if I make it in the future, I have a piece where I just trace and I know exactly the shape and size. And I'm usually cutting that piece out, you know, usually forming the shape and soldering it together with other pieces. Uh, it really just depends on the size, how much inlay there is, whether there's marriage of metals, just combining two metals together, which I do a lot. It's um, uh, this thing where I, I wrap you know, sterling and copper together and I oxidize the inside of that copper and kind of turn it a nice turquoise blue or whatever color it wants to be. And so that way, these simple forms, squares, circles, triangles, teardrops, uh, look, you know, very simple and look like lines from one aspect, but they turn a little bit and they just open up and they have this depth to them and this color. Uh, you know, it's really the hues that I can get from just like oxidizing and the surface texture I can get from how I finish the pieces. Primarily work with uh, sterling and copper. I also started working with gold recently too. And I only really work with metals. Something about metals has just always attracted me. You are working with iron, this structural element that holds up towers and buildings in New York and whatnot. And you put it in the fire and you take it out and it's putty. It's plastic. Here's this element that's so strong, but yet supple, and the way that you can just work it and make something from it. It's just, it's not necessarily a power trip, but it's definitely, I don't know, it's, it's powerful, and having that ability to shape something so strong is uh, attractive. And that's why I, I love metal, um, and I want to kind of stick with metal. And, just kind of push metal's boundaries. Yeah, they get, I get to work with, you know, creating hollow and creating form. And it's, uh, it's just captivating. Those pieces take a long time, but they're worth it. When I moved out here, the space where I work is uh, the greenhouse, but we totally reconstructed it to allow me to cohabitate in here with the green stuff when that comes in. Uh, probably the most important tool that I'm really proud of is uh, my bench. Um, uh, it's kind of built specifically for me and for my height and to be as ergonomic as possible. And uh, so I made that. It's super strong. I love it. And I made it to be a European style, wherein uh, there's a giant cutout for the bench pin where you're doing all your sawing and your cutting. 
so it becomes a little more ergonomic. You can kind of rest on it. Um, it's just a little bit better for your body. Yeah, I always knew that I wanted to do something for myself and for my own art. And uh, this is kind of how it's manifested. If anything, I'd, I'd say it's just a drive, the need to kind of create something new. But I'm always adding in new pieces and new ideas or changing that old idea. Uh, it's, it's just a continual process. I take some theme from that piece and make something new. And that's what keeps me going, is that moment when I need, feel the need to make something new, and I do. I definitely see myself doing this. And I will push jewelry you know, as far as I can possibly push it. Um, but I also kind of want to build up a sculpture studio too. <laughs> uh, I do, you know, have the urge to make big things, you know, and uh, that's that might be part of the future. But for right now, it's you know, it's Vermont and jewelry and yeah, being here. My name is Marta Sulaka. I am a self-taught pattern designer and textile designer. I was born and raised in Poland. I moved to the United States seven years ago and I live in Essex, Vermont. A few years ago, when we first moved into this house, I started making pillows and light upholstery out of fabrics that I would buy in just a regular store. I decided that that was not enough anymore. So I was thinking, how can I create my own patterns and how can I transform something from a hand-drawn design onto fabric? And I started Googling, I started researching, I started reading books and step by step, I basically taught myself how to screen print. I taught myself how to create a repeating pattern out of a hand-drawn drawn sketch or design. And there was a lot of mistakes and a lot of errors at the beginning and a lot of, a lot of learning. Home is a very important part of my life. We all spend so much time in our homes that I feel like it should represent who you are. It should show a story of who you are. When I create a pattern, when I design something, I always think of how this pattern can be used in a home. A very important part of my process is creating mood boards. Mood board is, it is a way for me to create cohesive collections. I might start with two pieces, two little, one pattern and one color inspiration, for example, and then I will keep adding to it. It's like taking pieces out of my head and putting them on a wall. All the patterns, colors, textures, it can be color inspiration that I saw in a magazine and I basically ripped a page. Or it can be something I saw online and printed out because it has the perfect shade of pink. It can be little pieces of linen that I hand dyed to achieve this, the color I had in my head, but I wanted to visualize it, I wanted to have it in my hand. I do believe that every pattern has a color mate. I don't believe that you can, you can use any color you want. Some patterns will look amazing only as black pattern on white fabric, that's it. If you try to make them into anything else, they just lose their power. I do have a day job and I am an accountant by day. I always had a hard time calling myself an artist or creative person because I don't have any artistic background or school. I actually have master's degree in sociology. 
I grew up with my parents having a clothing company, clothing line, and I, I helped a lot. I did a lot of ironing and sewing and helping, and, and I always <laughs> I would tell myself I would never do it. I would never have anything to do with fabric and sewing or anything like this. And then one day it just came back. It was Poland after, you know, after 1989 world where it was the transition that Poland was going uh, through from socialism and then free market and capitalism. Everybody had to decide what they want to do with their life and, and know that they're on their own now. For my parents, it was, it was owning a business, uh, but it wasn't easy. I've seen, you know, how it is to have money and see how it is to not have money. That's something that, that I just know. If you want to have something, you have to work for it. I never thought that I would get to the place I'm at right now. I never thought it would be a business. I would love to make it into my full-time job. I never thought when I was starting that I would have my own fabric line, that the bloggers or interior designers would feature my work, that they would love my work, that they would request samples and they would like to put my fabrics in their clients' houses. It's all people who found me through my social media. I want to say Instagram is my um, main marketing tool at this point. It is amazing. I have found so many amazing people through Instagram and so many people found me. What I believe my clients, who they are and where they come from is um, they care about the creative piece that is behind my pillows and fabrics. They appreciate the fact that I put so much of my heart and effort and so much of myself into every single piece that I create. It is amazing to, to know that you created something, that it's it's your hand that drew a pattern and it's going to be in somebody's home and it's going to be part of their life and uh, be on their couch or a chair or it's going to be drapes or whatever else they want to make you know it's it's a it's a piece that they're going to look at every single day and it's going to bring them some kind of joy it's it's just an amazing feeling yeah My name is Noel Bailey, I'm a potter and uh, I live in Waitsfield, Vermont. I make basically bowls, plates, mugs, cups, faces, pitchers, uh, a lot of what I think are quintessential pottery items. Uh, most of my work starts on the potter's wheel and it's after the potter's wheel that I tend to um, give my pieces more gesture and movement um, and that's where a lot of the, the the sculpting sort of starts. What I love about making functional wear is the interaction that happens between the maker and the user and the piece. Uh, cups, for one, are incredibly intimate. Something you hold near your lips and uh, being able to see the detail that's involved in the piece. Uh, there's so many design features that are from like a, a tapered lip rim that, that helps the liquid like come into your lips, into your mouth without dribbling down your face. Um, and two, I also think I think about like the angle of uh, how a person like men tend to hold a mug with a very straight arm and bend at the shoulder, where females tend to bend at the wrist, and it's a little bit more of a this kind of turn. I'm drawn to work that's that's quiet. I, I want the I want this the work to speak softly and not be not be loud or brash, um, and something that kind of over time can reveal itself. Um, details that make you want to look turn the piece over and see what's on the bottom and uh, and there's places where I'll cut all the way through um, the wall of a mug, for example, and then I'll put in clear glaze in there. And it lets light kind of come through, and, and, uh, and depending on the time of day, the work looks very different. 
I have this piece of paper hanging up in my studio. Uh, it's a page like on the back of an insurance contract and it says this page intentionally left blank. And that's, that's to remind me to uh, see how little I can add and to, to try to keep things quiet but, um, but, but rich in that kind of quiet and that solitude there. I was working at this, this clay center in Colorado and I had been working there for a couple summers. I was making some work that was technically it was very sound um, and I was feeling pretty good about it. The, the pots that I was making and I had this one particular mug that I thought was, just nailed it. I thought the glaze was was just right and it was the walls were thin and everything and, and so I went up to this artist and I said uh, so what do you think about this mug here and, uh, and he looked at it and he said well it's a, it's a nice mug um, but there's nothing about that mug that tells me about who you are and uh, that really uh, really stuck with me and, and got me to think a lot more about, well, what, what is unique about me and what can I make that will be different than everything out there and, and that will express the things that I'm interested in. I, I love to ice climb. I get to get up close and, and uh, play around in these really cool ice formations. And I like how it, it sort of uh, speaks to what it is on, um, but it changes it slightly. So you might have this really rough rock, but it has some certain curves to it. And that ice will relate to those curves. Even just snow that falls on my, my steps outside the studio door, I like seeing how the wind makes them transition from skinny to to thicker. I was born and raised in southwest Colorado. We had 40 acres and a canyon in our front yard. And, uh, uh, and the desert is, while often many people think of it as being devoid of water, it's this place that has been sculpted completely by water and wind. And, um, and so I find a lot of those graceful curves that I see in snow and ice also in the desert. Ice is this frozen version of water. And then I think of glazing in the same way. When I bring it up to temperature in the kiln, the glaze starts to melt and it becomes this material that's somewhat close to water. And then when the kiln cools, it's frozen. And so I think of that in a similar way, um, but perhaps just on a slightly different time scale. When we, we moved to Vermont, it was interesting to observe the, the water staining that happened from Hurricane Irene. Like on, uh, there was a barn down in the valley and the wood had completely changed color where the, the high water mark was. Um, I just started thinking about that as an influence and uh, would incorporate these horizontal lines into my work. And I, I would just sort of think about those horizontal lines as being these high water marks. I think a big component of my success in this is that it's a constant challenge and I don't ever feel like I've gotten there. It's a, there, there's so many things that can go wrong with this media that, uh, <laughs> that totally that keep me humble and uh, keep me striving, keep me on my toes.